Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the WSU OSU Tree Fruit Extension webinar series. I am your host today, Ashley Thompson, Oregon State University, Mid Columbia Fruit Tree Extension. Your other two hosts are Matt Whiting, uh, WSU, he's a professor of horticulture located in Prosser, and Bernardita Salato, she is Extension at WSU located in Prosser. So today our topic is going to be scouting and sampling for little cherry and its vectors. And our presenters, our presenters today are Dr. Scott Harper of WSU and the Clean Plant Center, Tiana DuPont, Extension, WSU, Wenatchee, and Dr. Tobin Northfield, WSU um, Entomology. All right, so I'll talk about uh, uh, X disease and sampling for the leaf hoppers that, that affected them. Talk a little bit about introducing some of these vectors, some of the vector population dynamics, in other words, when you can expect to find these leaf hoppers, some of the sampling methods, what's the best way of collecting them or uh, observing them, where to put those traps, um, because it turns out trapping is the best and most effective, efficient method uh, for monitoring them, some vector identification, because it doesn't help you to trap them if you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, and I'll spend a little bit extra time on that section because that can be tricky um, in a lot of insects. And then I want to talk really briefly about uh, the importance of suckers that uh, we have realized in the last uh, week or two. So, um, so stay tuned for that. And thank you all for uh, hanging out and I appreciate you listening. Okay, so one of the key questions that I get often is what makes a, a leafhopper a vector? Um, why aren't all leafhoppers vectors? And, and what has to happen is the phytoplasma has to get into the gut of the leafhopper, pass through the, the quote unquote blood or the hemolymph of the leafhopper, and then make it all the way to the salivary glands. And that can take, a, that generally takes a few weeks to go from the point where it acquires it in the gut to all the, it gets all the way to the salivary glands. glands. And um, there are several leafhoppers that can transmit and often they're fairly closely related. But that key stage is getting from the uh, hemolymph from the gut into the hemolymph, then surviving into the salivary glands. So in California, uh, and when they had an outbreak in the 80s, they had these two main leaf hoppers, Fibrilla florii on the left, and Colodonus montanus on the right. Uh, the one on the left, the common name is florii's leaf hopper, and the one on the right is the mountain leaf hopper. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we have those, but they're not that abundant. And what I should also say in California, what they found was that florii, uh, was often in, uh, prefers to feed on the trees, most cherry trees, and they really only found that when you had kind of out of control populations of leafhoppers, they abandoned orchards and the orchards were not being uh, maintained. And more commonly, they found that Montana. So what they found was that's more of a, uh, an herb specialist that would feed on the ground cover and then hop up in the trees from time to time. In the Pacific Northwest, we have two most common species are Colodanus reductus on the left and Geminatus on the right. And then we have a range of forest species that are less commonly found. So this is, uh, these are some patterns of abundance that were data collected by Holly Ferguson. Um, and then uh, this particular graph was sent to me by Garrett Bishop. Here you can find, and this is, and so I should say that uh, these are pretty similar to dynamics that they found in California, and then also relatively similar to the dolls in the 1950s. You have an outbreak, uh, first population peak in May, and so right now we're starting to collect them. We uh, have just started finding them in traps and in our soup nets uh, last week, and, and so they're starting to build up in populations right now. Then often you'll find a peak in August, and then you'll find a, another peak in October. And so this uh, increase in abundance is all post-harvest is where we think is really important, or at least in uh, a lot of orchards is post-harvest in ours. So the other thing to keep in mind is that leafhoppers are really only important in vectoring the X phytoplasma. And they have to pick up that X phytoplasma because they don't pass it on from mother to offspring. So every year they overwinter as eggs, and so when they emerge as eggs, those eggs are all de uh, disease free. And so they have to pick it up somewhere to transmit it. And so in California in the 1970s, and here in 1978, what they did was took four trees, put leafhoppers on them, and then saw if the leafhopper could pick up the phytoplasm and pass it on to another plant. 
And in April, they found that on those four trees they tried it on, they weren't able to pick it up. In May, they were starting to be able to. And really in August and September was when they were really likely to be picking up that phytoplasma. So now we can cut to decades later uh, in Scott Harper's group uh, in, in uh, Prosser, and they found that they did a totally different study where now they're looking at the, the ecstasy phytoplasma titers in the plant over time. And you can see, again, it's increasing over time. And so this corresponds with later on in the season, the phytoplasma starts building up in those plant tissues, and that's when the leafhoppers are most likely to pick it up. And so this is really why we think the biggest um, and most concerning time um, point is post-harvest. So there are a few ways of collecting them, and the main thing about collecting them is if you want to keep them alive, or if you don't care, most of you will not care uh, to keep them alive. In fact, probably prefer that they're not alive, um, which is fine, which is great. Um, if you want to keep them alive, and then you can do sweep netting. This is uh, Adrian Marshall, a postdoc in my lab, just finished his PhD uh, with Betsy Pierce. He's sweeping up some sagebrush. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he didn't find any uh, of the important vectors and that, those sagebrush sweeps. Uh, and then these sticky cards are really the most effective. And in the 80s, they tried all different types of approaches and really ended up with just your run-of-the-mill yellow sticky card. All it has to be is yellow and sticky. There's a lot of options from a lot of different companies, some that fold in on themselves, some that are one-sided, some that are double-sided. As long as it's yellow and sticky, it should work. And, um, and then the, I should also say that we're trialing some, um, we're going to be trying some um, traps that preserve leaf hopper DNA, um, but that would really be more for research purposes at this point. So we, then the question is, where do you put these traps? So generally, you can keep them about below five feet high as a general rule. And this depends on where they're feeding, of course. Uh, there was a study in California in the 1990s, 80, late 80s, early 90s, and there they found that when it when an orchard was completely unmanaged and out of control, then and only then did they find the leafhoppers high up in the canopy. And that was because they're feeding on those trees high up in the canopy, uh, and then they're, and early in the season and out of the season, they're leaving it under those trees. The majority of the time, and I'll show some data here in a second, it's lower in the canopy because they're probably using these uh, ground cover as avenues into, into the, the orchard. And so uh, just this is a, uh, just to give you an idea of the size, this is a five by seven inch card. And this is one of the leafhoppers here. Uh, I'll go over the identification here soon. But this yellow band you can see on this leafhopper is characteristic of both Colodonus reductus and Colodonus montanus. Doesn't matter which one of those for all intents and purposes, it's not good and you don't want it in the orchard because the, those, both of those are vectors. So this is a study done in the 1950s. This is just to show uh, data to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The 1950s and the dolls, they put up these big posts and put yellow sticky cards all the way up the posts from five to 15 feet, and then dropped off dramatically from five to 15 feet. This is on a log scale, and so you can think of this as a really downward, um, or dropping up really rapidly. The other thing that they show, that I won't show here, is that catch was much lower when it was windy. So they plotted the, the daily catch that they had against the wind speed. And on days when it was really windy, they, the catches dropped down. If it was uh, not windy, then the leafhoppers are more likely to fly. And so if you all of a sudden have this surge in leafhoppers and you're watching it closely, uh, keep in mind that if it's particularly windy that day, you won't see as many leafhoppers move. And then once the wind picks, dies down, then they'll start moving more quickly. So it's worth keeping that in mind. And this is all done in Colodonus geminatus, which is one of the two more abundant vectors we've got here. So then in California in the 1970s, um, there was a guy named Sandy Purcell that did a lot of really great research. He looked at below, 50, below five feet high. So this is the feet in, in height in inches. These are some uh, other different leafhoppers that um, aren't a problem here um, in, in X disease phytoplasma. But this polka dotted one, is the uh, Colodonus montanus. That's pictured here on the left. And he found that he had a uh, highest capture in 20 inches, uh, and then he caught some at 10 inches, and then uh, up to 60 inches, up to five feet. One thing to keep in mind is in California, uh, they didn't have, they had, there was often more bare ground uh, 
uh, orchards. And so I'm not entirely sure what how how high the, that um, that ground cover is. But if you have the ground cover is above the traps, and then leaf hoppers aren't going to be able to see that. So you want to get those traps a little bit above that, at least a little bit above the ground cover. These are uh, two of the pictures of the prime suspects of F X disease, phytoplasma, in uh, Washington and Oregon. Colodonus geminatus was studied quite a bit by uh, someone named Mervyn Nielsen in the 19, uh, 1950s, as well as Homer Wolf, who worked on it at, in, w, in Wenatchee. And then this is Colodonus reductus here on the right. And this is a, a penny just uh, for scale. They're about roughly about two and a half millimeters long. So then the question is, given that these aren't relatively large insects, how do we identify them? So with Reductus and, and, and Montanus, it's relatively straightforward because they have this big yellow band on the, on the um, prothorax, or you can think about it as sort of behind, on the neck. Colodonus Reductus does not have a common name. Colodonus Montanus is the mountain leafhopper, and it's not as common in the Pacific Northwest. This was the big problem in California. One thing I do want to point out, this leafhopper here um, has a, if this leafhopper is about 104 in leafhopper years. Uh, it was collected uh, in October, and then we just kept that alive for a, quite a while. And so what happens with leafhoppers over time is that the coloration starts to deteriorate. So I'm showing this partly to show that there is variation between this leafhopper, which is caught probably the first week of its existence and stuck on a yellow sticky card to this leafhopper, which is a bit older, and you can see the colors start to pale, but you can still see the yellow band behind the head. So that yellow band is indicative of uh, Reductus or Montanus. If you're interested, there's an extra yellow, pretty good sized patch, Montanus. Reductus has a smaller patch of any, but the main thing is the yellow stripe, you don't want it. So Geminatus is harder to identify um, initially, and that's because it's this sort of this green color, there's no yellow stripe, and so it might be viewed as a little bit harder. It also varies in color. So this is a kind of a greener color. This is more of a yellowish, um, blackish color. This was caught a couple weeks ago here on the right. And so when insects try to develop keys for identifying these in, in, insects in general, the, the, um, the, the methods of identifying it can be sort of, uh, well, it can be something like, the postocular CD is longer than the rest of the hairs on the insect. And that can be kind of a tricky thing to do. And so we've tried to come up with a creative solution, which I think is uh, effective. And this is all motivated by, um, I grew up uh, living outside of Mount Rainier and you see the, the deer head on the, on the mountain. Um, this is actually identified by uh, Adrian uh, Marshall, who grew up here in Wenatchee. Uh, and one of the things you'll see here is that there's a face on the back of this, this leafhopper. You may not see it at first, but once you see it, it's on all these Geminatus, and I think that it's a key to identifying this. So I'll show a few of these pictures just to give you an idea and get it ingrained in your mind. So these are the two eyes, and then we've got a mustache right here. There's the mustache, there's the eyes, on the right on the back of the insect. And so if you see that, you can start looking at it. You can start to see some, we um, looked at some other pictures of some other mustaches and eyes, Feel free to take any of these uh, entertainment um, uh, personas as a motivation to identify that. Here again is the face. You can see it again here on Dennis Hopper from Freerider. Sunglasses in this scenario, big mustache, big mustache, two eyes. Paul Senior from uh, American Chopper and Danny Trejo, and of course, Yosemite Sam. The other thing that we've noticed is that there's this pirate hat here that occurs. It might be different colors, but it's always there. So you can also um, view it if you have kids. I'm sure you're familiar with the Lego movie and Metal Beard. That's another, another option. So obviously these aren't entirely scientific, but this this face is this pattern is on every one of these leaf hoppers that we've seen and that we've seen pictures of and we've collected. And so it seems to be as good a diagnostic tool as, as we found. All right. So one of the things I also want to mention is. Um, in a couple, uh, last week, uh, when Adrian, my postdoc, was uh, collecting, he commented that he was collecting a lot of leafhoppers, sweeping along the ground cover, along weeds in the ground cover, as well as the suckers in the trees. These suckers might be incredibly important for disease transmission, 
for a lot of reasons. One is they're fast growing and tender, which make them really good sources of nutrition for leafhoppers. Leafhoppers like to grow in fast growing, tender parts of trees. The other thing is that as they're moving along the ground cover, those are right there near the ground cover. And so the height of those might be really uh, accessible to the leafhoppers. And the other thing is they're connected to the roots and it's not a long distance to the roots. So just last week, Adrian made this uh, uh, observation. I let Scott Harper know, um, who's here also. And then he immediately went out and collected some uh, suckers and ran diagnostics on it. And this week we found that they are actually, he found that they are actually, those ones are infected with phytoplasma. So this is another thing that we've just found out. Um, we haven't obviously done the research to identify how common this is, but we, I want to mention this uh, as soon as we can, um, that this could be an issue of these tree suckers. And so removing those tree suckers could be really important for um, disease transmission or reducing disease transmission. So just to summarize uh, some of the take-home messages, for sampling, you can use yellow sticky cards. The periods that we really want to focus on, they're come, starting to come out now. They're going to be especially common um, in the August and then uh, through October. You can just keep probably keep them generally less than five feet high. You want to make them uh, available so that the leafhoppers can see them. Obviously, it's a yellow stimulus. If you're wondering why yellow, a lot of insects are attracted to yellow. Yellow can be viewed as sort of a super green, that uh, that's just how they see it. It's usually it's very, very green and, and fast growing. And then um, you can, the other thing to keep in mind is you can use these, if you think that the leafhoppers are in a certain part of your orchard, you can put those in, put the leaf, these sticky cards in that part of the orchard and compare it to somewhere else in the orchard. And so you can use these as a, to develop, uh, test some of your intuitions about what you have going on in your own orchard. So don't just view this as an idea of track them over time, but you can also use these in space. And so the other thing uh, I talked about is identification. For this Colodanus reductus, where you're really looking for this yellow stripe behind the, uh, the head. And then for Geminatus, it's this, um, it's this face right here on the back. All right, so, and then the other thing I want to mention is these tree suckers, we just made these observations within the last couple of weeks, but we think that these tree suckers might be important. And so it's something you watch out for as we progress. And so with that, I um, have some, uh, some uh, I'd like to take any questions. Thanks a lot. Hey, Tobin, we've got two questions for you. The first one is, bee lot leaf hoppers are early and abundant in the basin this year. Should I be concerned about adjoining potato fields? You say uh, beet leaf hoppers? Beet leaf hoppers, yes. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So one thing that is um, beet leaf hoppers, we can be pretty confident beet leaf hoppers are not vectors of, um, of um, X disease phytoplasma. They do transmit uh, purple talk which is the, the beet leaf hopper transmitted agent. Um, there was a, when the, when these, there was two prominent labs in, in UC Berkeley, uh, Jensen and later uh, Purcell, they worked right next to the group that were working on beet leaf hoppers. And so they were working back and forth and they never found any interaction between uh, beet leaf hopper and phytoplasma. If it does, it's probably incredibly rare. And so it's not, at this point, I'm in constant communication with people who are working in potatoes, but uh, at this point, we don't have any reason to believe that, that they're important. So Tobin, do you place the sticky cards on the border of the orchard, and how many sticky cards should you use per acre? So the, yeah, the question about, um, can, you can put yellow sticky cards on the border. The issue with that is if you catch high abundances in the, in the border, it's, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're coming from outside the, the orchard. So if you, have, if you imagine that, uh, that you have a, an orchard with a whole bunch of uh, beautiful trees, and the leafhopper is moving along through that orchard and it gets to the edge and it gets into a, 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 a parking lot is right next to it and you've got this massive yellow trap and that there's nothing else around it. That's the only thing that that leafhopper is going to be attracted to and so it might hit that that trap. And so you can still get really high abundances on a trap at the edge of the orchard 
just because there's nothing else around it. There's no, uh, there's no competing trees, there's no competing plants. And so you can get a, an edge effect like that simply because there's no, um, that because, because it doesn't want any, anything else around that trap. And this is, uh, edge effects occur for a lot of reasons. A lot of people are familiar with edge effects with codling moths. It doesn't mean the codling moths are coming from outside the orchard. It just means that they start to accumulate on the edges. And so you can absolutely uh, put yellow sticky cards at the edge of orchards. Um, but if you really think that they're coming from somewhere, you would really have to put yellow sticky cards where you think they're coming from and not just on the edge of the orchard. So that was the first question. What was the second question, Ashley? Any of these yellow sticky cards should you place per acre? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, the, yeah, how many should you put up per acre? Um, at this point, we don't really know how, the big question there is how tightly aggregated are these leaf hoppers? Um, and we don't know how, how tightly aggregated they are. What I would focus on instead is trying to, most of you know the orchard, your orchard better than anyone and use that intuition and that understanding about that orchard to guide your trap placement. So if you have some areas that have been hit really hard in the past by X disease, then you might wanna put some uh, traps in that area and then put it in a reference spot somewhere else. Uh, and so you can, you can, what I would encourage people to do is let their intuition guide them uh, in putting out the, or the number of traps. If I tell you a number, it's gonna be more than you're gonna to wanna to put out, um, but, the, but the underlying uh, reasoning is that, that you want to try to figure out, get an idea for uh, where they are and, and, and uh, try to sample as much of the variability as you can. The other thing to th keep in mind is I'm pretty sure that these leaf hoppers are moving down the rows uh, rather than between the rows. And so you may want to, um, it, if you have a couple traps that are relatively close to each other within the row, that will probably give you different information than if you have them on different rows because you'll get sort of two avenues of, of leaf if you have them across the two rows. So I realize that's, an, that's a, um, a not as, as helpful as, a, as an answer as just giving a number, but I would really let um, your intuition guide you in figuring those out. So Tobin, are there any plans to include these two leaf hoppers in the decision aid system? So that ultimately, uh, that would be that would be a great um, thing to do. Right now, what we're focused on is developing a better understanding of the phenology of these leaf hoppers. Um, it wouldn't make sense. We don't want to put them in a decision aid, decision aid system without enough data. It takes a lot of data to get those phenology models. And so, right now, what we're focused on is building up as much phenology data as we can, so that when the time comes, we get enough data, we can put them in. But at this point, it would be um, if we don't have enough data to put it into decision aid. Thank you so much, Tobin. Are there any predators of these two leaf hoppers? We don't know what they are for sure yet, um, um, but they're in the 50s, they identified a parasitoid of leaf hoppers. Uh, there was, it was identified. There's a couple of things where they found it, but we don't know how abundant it is. My guess is the spiders are really good predators of these, um, and then some of the generalist predators, but uh, probably spiders, the, the biggest, the biggest um, predators, whether web spinners or um, non-web spinners feeding in the grasses. Okay, so uh, leaf hoppers generally have a really wide host range. Uh, the, they don't, they're not like uh, a crop specialist that we often think about that just makes a beeline for the, the crop and feeds on it. My favorite analogy is that they wander around like toddlers at a buffet line, just shoving food in their mouth until they find somewhere they're at. Like, and they just stay at that end. So you don't see toddlers at the broccoli end of the buffet line. They're all at the donuts or whatever. Um, and so, so th they, that's one of the things it's hard to identify what is the host plant of uh, the leafhopper because they will walk, they'll go, hop around feeding on so many other different plants. Right now we're collect, we're, we're, um, we can grow them on, um, uh, we have in our colonies things like clover and dandelion. Um, they like, um, they will feed on, uh, one of the main things to think about when you think about these controls is they will feed on grasses, but grasses are not host for phytoplasma. And so if you're not careful, some of these things will actually, um, you can out, you can get the, the grass might be out competing the, 
some of these broadleafs. The broadleafs are more likely to be host for phytoplasma. And so if you're not careful, you can remove the grass and allow the broadleaf weeds to take over. And then you have something that can host both the leafhoppers and the phytoplasma. And so grass is really our friend, even though leafhoppers might feed on it, because it's not actually a, uh, a host for the phytoplasma. And so that's, remember the leafhoppers have to repick these up every single year. And so that's a big factor. Thank you very much. We know that it's a very busy time. Thank you, Tobin, Tiana, and Scott. But we will ask you to share this information and make your neighbors aware. This is a community effort. So if you can share awareness and, and information and lead them to us, uh, it will be better for all of the industry, probably. Thank you, Bernadita and Ashley, for organizing it. Thank you all for listening.